the uh, Guy Veller, uh, past president of the American Hernia Society, and you know, has probably lectured to and taught uh, hernia to you know, more people than just about anybody on the planet. And Guy, we look forward to your, your discussion of the, you know, what it means to actually close the abdominal wall in hernia repair. Thanks, Doug. I, I guess that means I'm just old. Uh, hush. Um, probably a better question, is, is there a physiologic advantage to restoring abdominal wall continuity? And I think that's what this whole session, uh, or a part of the session revolves around. Uh, I, and I don't think we know. I don't think we know enough to really answer that question, but that's probably a more pertinent question. Before the laparoscopic era, this is the way American surgeons fix ventral hernias with an inlay. They put the mesh in between the defect. Um, George Wants went to Europe and he learned from uh, Rene Stopa and Dr. Reeves to do the sublay repair. I was taught that as a resident. That was our technique we developed for the laparoscopic approach because the recurrence rate was 6.2%. Prior to this, the recurrence rate ran into 30 to 40%. And American surgeons now use sublay. Uh, onlay is just as good, by the way, but sublay has become pretty much the standard of care. And then Todd got behind uh, Adrian, Bruce, and myself, and this was all Todd's energy, I can assure you. And uh, we, uh, uh, Adrian presented this at the American Surgical. And we found that the laparoscopic approach could mimic the open approach with respect to recurrence. When I presented at the American Hernia meeting, uh, the Europeans uniformly criticized us because they felt the incisional hernia was more than just a hole in the abdominal wall. And laparoscopically, that's all we were doing was patching a hole. You saw Morris just tell you that uh, closing the hole is beneficial. Um, it, it looks good. Uh, he, he, he has always called me a closeted closure because I, on occasion I would do it. But I don't know that we know that whether it's good or bad. The abdominal wall function uh, is important to understand the rectus muscles do support the abdominal wall and your lateral muscles insert on the midline via the rectus sheath. If you look at the rectus sheath, it's very broad uh, and it's, it's an important part with respect to your abdominal wall. Jean Reeves called incisional hernia eventration disease and you have to remember that what he's describing here is totally different from what Morris just showed you. Uh, eventration disease is the large hernia, the big hernia that uh, you see when you see the bad pictures of, uh, of significant hernias, and he called it eventration disease. And there's really two types of eventration disease. You have the reducible type, and uh, the patient doesn't have much respiratory compromise. It may be a big hernia, but they don't have respiratory compromise. You repair the hernia, and they usually don't have a lot of problems postoperatively. You then have irreducible eventration disease, and Reeves called this the second abdomen. And this is the patient with a loss of domain. The intestines come and reside outside the abdomen, and now you have two compartments. You have the hernia compartment and the abdominal compartment. And even these patients, if you watch these patients with loss of domain, uh, there's not that much respiratory problem until you cram everything back into their abdominal cavity, and that's when you have the problem. But with this eventration disease, you get the paradoxical motion, the bowels get pushed out, the back muscles are not counterbalanced by the abdomen, you get the lordosis, the postural changes, and then the lateral abdominal muscles retract. They are no longer inserting on the midline onto the rectus sheath. They become fibrotic. They retract. That makes the hernia larger, and then you see the skin changes that you see. Uh, the Michigan group showed in a rat model of chronic incisional hernia that this is in fact the case. If you take the internal oblique muscles and look at this model, they did atrophy, they became fibrotic, they became stiff, and this uh, was scientific proof of what uh, uh, Dr. Reeves talked about in the 70s. So along comes component separation, and Oscar Maria, Bruce is going to talk about it, but Oscar Ramirez described this in 1990, and it absolutely lay dormant in the general surgical uh, arena. Plastic surgeons uh, were using it, but we, we ignored it for a long time. And now it's achieved the popularity that uh, you see here at the meeting and that Bruce will talk about. Um, one, I just want to say something real quick. Bruce is going to talk about it, but you'll notice that he calls it component separation. And this is not just a release. If you're going to do this, you want to separate the internal oblique from the external oblique. You want to separate the rectus fascia from the rectus muscle to get the maximum advancement. It was component separation, not components release. 
we did this in Memphis. Uh, Tim Fabian, our trauma group, published this in 1994 in the annals. Uh, we've updated it twice since then. Uh, the release for trauma is just a little bit different, but I'm not going to go into details. But we were big fans of components release and, and felt it played a role. But the question then becomes now that we're looking at components release, trying to get the midline closed, trying to do what Morris told us to do, how does the piece, the placement of a piece of mesh alter this physiologic function of the abdominal wall? We're going to cut the external oblique, we're going to cut the rectus, we're going to advance things. How does it alter uh, the abdominal wall function? I don't think we know. We know from Schemperlich and Kling's uh, work that if you put a big heavy piece of mesh on the anterior abdominal wall, it becomes stiff. Is that bad? I don't know with respect to function. It may be bad with respect to the patient feeling it, but is it bad with respect to function? I don't think we know the answer. Dumanian's done, he's a plastic surgeon. He's done some really good work with components. Bruce probably will talk about him, but he just published this in Annals where he had significant hernias. These are loss of domain hernias now where he had to do a components release. And he looked at PFTs before and three months after. These are pulmonary function tests. And he measured the intra-abdominal volume the intra-abdominal volume was ma measured via CAT scan, and it, it increased by 6%. The diaphragm height did not change. The peak airway pressure stayed normal, and the pulmonary functions uh, were the same pre- and post-op with the component separation. So this tells us that physiologically, it probably helps to get the muscles back to the midline, but does it improve the function of the abdominal wall? I don't think it answers that question. And then Lowe was way ahead of the game. Lowe first used the balloon for components in 1994, and then it's been modified and Mike Rosen repopularized it. So now we've got minimally invasive components release. We've got Dr. Franklin closing the defect. So now we're able to answer the European criticism that laparoscopically we can get the hole closed. We can get the rectus muscles back to the midline. And the Mayo group, uh, well, oh, let me talk about this slide. Chalela is doing the same thing. This is a nice series of 400 laparoscopic repairs. And what he does is he calls it the suturing concept. He either closes it internally or he closes it externally, again, trying to, uh, trying to do, get the rectus to the midline. And then uh, the Mayo group reported the laparoscopic components with the closure of the defect that Morris just showed you, the release that they got, and so now laparoscopically we're answering the criticism. However, what about quality of life? Everybody's trying to close the hole, everybody's trying to get the rectus muscles back to the midline, and believe me, I'm a big believer in that, but I don't, and I do a lot of open repairs, more than I do laparoscopic. But let's look at quality of life studies. This is quality of life looking at a laparoscopic repair versus an open repair. Okay, they use the SF36, and for those of you who don't know, it looks at all sorts of things, health perception, vitality, all these other things. In this study, there was no difference, no difference at all in the quality of life between the laparoscopic, where their hole was only covered, their hole was only covered, there was no closure, no medialization, and the open group where that was done, there was no difference in quality of life. If you look at Todd's group in Carolina, they found something even, diff even more different. When they looked at quality of life, they, there was fewer uh, open repairs in this study. But when they looked at this, the general health was better in the laparoscopic group, the vitality was better, the mental health was better, and more importantly, on the Carolina's comfort scale, the scores were better for walking, exercise, and total comfort. Well, that's a pretty good, for me anyway, that's a pretty good evaluation of the functioning of the abdominal wall. If you're walking okay, you're exercising okay, must mean your abdominal wall's doing okay. So this tells me that covering the hole probably is a good thing. So you end up with a laparoscopic approach, the open approach, closing the defect, components release, a hybrid, and I think it all is a matter of function of the patient, function of the surgeon's ability. I think the decision is uh, which one to use on which patient. I don't really know that we know that right now. And hopefully young people out there like Alfie and, uh, and Yuri and some folks I see will figure out uh, what, what we need to do. I think these are important questions. I don't think we know how important a functioning abdominal wall is. Uh, Todd's study shows that you can uh, have a very a good quality of life and function quite well with just having your hole covered up. I don't think we know who needs a functioning abdominal wall. And I don't think we know which patients need which repair. Uh, the Scandinavians are beating us to the punch. This is a nice study just published in hernia. They took, and these are big hernias now. These aren't just little holes like you saw from Morris. These are big holes, large or giant hernias. 
no mention of component separation in these uh, in these uh, study in the study, but they had an IPOM eight eight had a sublay eight had an onlay, and they put them on this BioDex four machine which measures abdominal wall strength, and it didn't matter whether they had an onlay a sublay or an IPOM, there was no difference in abdominal wall strength between the groups. So this group is also looking at the abdominal wall function prior to repair, after repair. With you know, Hopefully they'll look at all of these things and hopefully someone else. But I think all those questions need to be answered before, before we have the data we need. Thanks very much.